We're going from the mundane to the sacred. So if you have your Bibles in hand, uh, make sure you've got a finger in there at Revelation chapter 2, beginning in verse 12, the passage Elisa read for us. We're continuing in our series in the book of Revelation that will be a series with several several mini-series in this whole course of the book of Revelation. This this section, uh, Letters from Jesus, covers the seven letters to the seven churches in Asia and uh, will end at the end of March and we'll take uh, one month in March to focus on uh, the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ. So, did I say March? April. Uh, starting with the Easter Sunday uh, for that next four weeks. And then we'll be back into Revelation uh, for the uh, mini-series that will focus on the seals, the seven seals, uh, starting in May. So there's where we're going. And right now we're going to Revelation chapter 2, verse 12. So would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, it's um, an incredibly uh, scary thing to uh, presume to teach on the book of Revelation, Lord. But we thank you for your Holy Spirit who gave us these words of Scripture. We thank you for uh, the wisdom and the guidance we find in Scripture itself for understanding these things, even when they are difficult. But Father, so much more difficult than interpreting a book like Revelation is applying the gospel to our hearts so that we understand our own sin and need for you, that we turn from either self-reliance or depending on things that are not from you, and we turn instead to relying on Jesus. The song we just sang, Father, said that the day will come when you will be mine forever, and even now you are mine forever. Which means that the great goodness of the gospel is we get God. We inherit a relationship with God. We have a share in God. We get to spend eternity with you and knowing you and being known by you. Father, forgive us for all the sin in which we turn from you. And we choose and we prefer and we desire things that aren't you. Would you forgive us those sins, Father? Would you give us humility to confess those sins freely this morning? And would you lead us to once again choose you, to cling to Jesus who you've given to us as God and Savior, to love him and be loved by him, to be restored from shame in our weakness, to strength and power in his name, to bring you glory, Lord, in your kingdom. We ask this in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Each one of these letters written to the seven churches in the Roman province of Asia is introduced by uh, drawing attention to something specific about who Jesus is. In this letter, the one to Pergamum in uh, verses uh, 12 through 17 of Revelation 2, Jesus introduces himself by pointing to his sharp two-edged sword. And if that sounds ominous... It is. Look at verse 12 with me. And to the angel of the church in Pergamum write, the words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword. Knowing that this speaker is Jesus, the resurrected, glorified God in the flesh. And he is carrying a sword. And he's pointing out to these people the sword that he's carrying. It's actually the sword of his mouth. But that it's a sword nonetheless. And he's pointing this out and now saying, listen to what I say. There's a lot compelling us to listen. Even without a precise definition yet of of what that sword from Christ's mouth, what that symbol is, what it means, even without a precise definition... I'll try to give a better definition towards the end of this sermon. But even without a precise definition now, you know what we can tell? It's a sword. Swords are dangerous. Being a Christian under the Roman Empire, when this letter was written at the end of the first century AD, being a Christian under the Roman Empire could be dangerous. Being a fake Christian when Jesus returns to this world, will be a lot more dangerous. There were some members of the congregation in the city of Pergamum who thought that they were Christians, but they were in a very real danger of proving that they didn't really believe in Jesus. They kept choosing other things instead of Jesus. 
They kept listening to other promises instead of the promises of Jesus. They kept giving themselves over to worship other things instead of worshiping Jesus. And they kept looking for comfort or security or safety from other things instead of from Jesus. The church in Pergamum had had good ministers. And every pastor worth his calling feels the burden of knowing some of the people in his church might mostly agree with Christian teaching, but they don't really believe in or trust in Jesus Christ. There are always some of those people. There are always some of us like that in every church. The sharp, two-edged sword of Christ should be a reminder that right now has already got us trembling a little bit. A reminder of how dangerous it is for church-going people to think that they are saved when they aren't. That was my, revel- my introduction, a lot shorter than last week's introduction, I realize. My question is, what does real faith look like? Look with me at verse 13. I know where you dwell, says Jesus, where Satan's throne is. Yet you hold fast my name, and you did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. There are a lot of symbols in the book of Revelation, as we've learned already in the series so far. Uh, the book is strewn with symbols. It doesn't mean the book is, uh, has only a symbolic meaning. It means that these symbols need to be deciphered to understand the literal things that they represent. And the, some of the symbols in this passage uh, are the Satan's throne, um, the idea of the Nicolaitans themselves, what that means, uh, the hidden manna at the end in verse 17, and the white stone with a name on it. These are symbols. And I'll try to make sure that we get some light on what these symbols mean, but to make sure that we read this the right way, I need to point out that Jesus here, in verse 13, Jesus is not addressing the whole church here. He's addressing the minister. Look with me again at verse 12. To the angel of the church in Pergamum right. And then when he says in verse 13, I know where you dwell, he's talking to that angel, which is a Greek word that means messenger. And it could be an angelic heavenly being or it could be a human messenger. Context shows whether it's one or the other. In this case, and I think if you look back over our sermon so far, then uh, you would hopefully would agree with me that these angels are the ministers or the pastors, the senior pastors, whatever we want to call them, that were appointed to read each of these seven letters in the congregation when the church received the letter. I ran out of breath. So the angel here is the pastor, and when Jesus says in verse 13, I know where you dwell, that word you is singular. It's talking to one person. I know where you dwell. In fact, in verse 13, the word you is used four times in our English translation. And the first three of them are singular. It's talking to this one person, the minister or pastor of the church in Pergamum. One other thing that I think we need to get straight just so that we read this the right way is to know that the word dwell means to stay. That where Jesus says, I know where you dwell. The word dwell doesn't mean he's passing through. He's not a sort of, oh, he might stay here for another few years. It has the idea of staying put of planting his roots there in that city of Pergamum, a permanent resident, which is helpful to know because when we get to the end of verse 13, we see that there's somebody else who's also decided to stay there in in Pergamum. This is where Satan dwells. So the pastor has decided to stay put because Satan has decided to stay put there. And this is what Jesus commends. He says to the pastor, sort of, it's as if he's saying... I know how hard it has been for you to keep on keeping on, going on as the pastor in the church of Pergamum, of all places. But it's important because Satan's decided to stay camped there. I know it's difficult, Jesus is saying, and one of the reasons we can see that it's difficult, perhaps this is why it was so difficult, was Jesus also says this is where Satan's throne is. 
And there are at least three reasons why Jesus might say that. I'm suggesting that the idea of Satan's throne is not literal, but symbolic. And I think there's three reasons at least why Jesus might have said Pergamum was the place of Satan's throne. First, because Pergamum was home to a giant altar to Zeus. Second, it had a large and popular temple to Asclepius. And third, it was literally the Asian capital of emperor worship. So those three things. The first one is interesting to me. Heather and I were in Berlin a few years ago. I don't remember how many years ago. 2015, I think that was our 20th anniversary. I should be able to do the math. Uh, But we saw there in the Pergamum Museum, I think that's not Pergamon Museum, I think they call it in in the modern way they translated that. In Berlin, there is a giant, when you walk into the main display, there is this giant series of steps and pillars and it's an altar. It's the altar of Zeus and it's shaped something like a throne. And so it's, um, a lot of commentators over the years have pointed out the original location of this altar of Zeus was high up, 800 feet high up on the edge of a cliff, over, like literally overshadowing the city of Pergamum right below it. And when you looked up, it looked like a giant altar of a god or giant throne of a god. And so when the Pergamum readers would hear, or the, the, the congregation would hear the pastor reading this letter and t- talk about the throne of Satan, their mind would probably quickly go there. The second thing was that this temple of the god Asclepius was all the rage in Pergamum. He was supposed to have been a, a, a god of healing, and his emblem, of course, if you're going to be a god of healing, of course your emblem would be a snake, of course, you, you were thinking that too. And so naturally, of course, what would you put in a temple for the God of healing? Snakes. So that if you were a sick person, sick people traveled from far and wide to come visit this temple. The idea was that if you were a sick person, you would spend the night in the temple just hoping and praying that one of those snakes would slither right over to you. Hopefully over you. And touched you, and then maybe you would be healed. This would not be the place where people like Elisa or Heather would be tempted (laughs) to go and seek healing. Jews and Christians, of course, were horrified by this imagery around the god Asclepius. That the idea that he represented healing, when in the Bible the serpent was an image not for healing, but for Satan. And finally, the third thing, in Pergamum, it was the religious capital of the province of Asia, the Roman province of Asia, but it was also the original capital of Caesar worship. This is where it began. Its first such temple to a Caesar, to the divine Augustus Caesar and the goddess of Rome, had been built in 29 BC, which is like 25 or 26 years before Jesus was born. Another temple to the Emperor Trajan was built just a few years after John wrote this letter of Revelation. Just a few years after this to the Emperor Trajan. And so this cult of imperial worship, of Caesar worship, was going strong. It was the dominant idea of, of Pergamum. It was the city that had put them on the, or the, the thing that had put Pergamum on the map and made Pergamum prestigious in all of Asia. Fame, wealth, prestige, power, and influence flowed in and out of the city because of their worship of Caesar. Pergamum called itself, and I think it's on some of the old coinage that has been found, is they called themselves a neokoros, which is a Greek word which means literally temple sweeper. You can see why that would attract fame and prestige. Well, it's a weird claim, but understanding what they meant by that makes more sense. One scholar explains that, he says, behind the title, Neocoros, there lies an idea which in itself is a lovely idea. That it was a city's greatest privilege to render even the humblest service to the God who had taken up his residence within it. Pergamus was the city which called itself the Neocoros of the temple where Caesar was worshipped. Pergamus was a city where Caesar worship was at its most intense, a city dedicated to glorying in the worship of Caesar. And that made life dangerous for Christians who would not give Caesar what belonged only to Jesus. That danger was what got their previous pastor killed. The man who received this letter when John wrote it 
this angel or the minister addressed in verse 12, he had seen his predecessor die rather than betray King Jesus. Look at the rest of verse 13. Yet you hold fast my name, and you did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. Christian tradition says that Antipas was the senior pastor or the bishop of the church in Pergamum, and that he was killed a few years before this was written. And that's why the third use, or the fourth use, I mean, of the word you in verse 13 is plural. So it's you singular, you singular, you singular, you plural. Let me read it again. I know where you dwell, singular. I know where Satan's throne is, yet you hold fast, singular, my name. And you, singular, did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among all of you, where Satan dwells. A number of the Christians still alive in Pergamum, in this church, had seen their previous pastor remain faithful to Christ, even to the point of dying for his faith. And they'd seen their current pastor, even under all that pressure, hold fast and keep the name of Jesus. Hold to the truth as he understood it. In spite of the power, the wealth, and the popularity of the cults, in spite of the pressure and the fear of the Roman persecution of Christians, in spite of all the peer pressure of all the different religious attractions in that city, in spite of the political opposition to Christianity, both these pastors had stayed firm. Well, that's what real faith in Jesus looked like in Pergamum when John wrote this letter. Which leads me to my second question. What did fake Christianity look like? Verse 14 says this. I have a few things against you. Who's he writing to? The pastor. He's writing, Jesus is speaking to the minister, the angel of that church. I have a few things, says Jesus, against you. Singular. Small is the way we should understand that word translated a few things. It's a small thing, Jesus says. It's not a big complaint. It's not a big criticism. It's a small criticism. And I love the way Jesus says that, as if he doesn't want to crush the pastor. He wants to inspire him, encourage him to do better. This otherwise faithful pastor in Pergamum needed some correction, and that's what Jesus is saying here. So in verse 14, I have a few things against you, just a small thing. It's a wonderful thing when pastors obey Jesus and when they stay where he calls them to stay long term man those men inspire me I've known some pastors who stayed in one place there's one fellow up uh, and uh, up island and he's been the pastor in, in one of our sister churches for I think it's 27 years what a great long term ministry my grandfather pastored Maple Ridge Baptist Church where I grew up for 45 years what a great long term ministry what a faithfulness This man had stayed put long term. That's what the word dwell means. But it's only a wonderful thing when pastors do that, when they also say what Jesus tells them to say. Not just stay where he tells them to stay, but to say what he tells them to say. And I hate to think how many well-meaning pastors, because they're well-meaning, tolerate what Jesus doesn't tolerate. When they are soft, when Jesus would be stern. When they compromise, when Jesus would confront. And I have to confess to you, this is one of the greatest temptations in my ministry. If a truck driver ignores the maximum weight or height limit on a bridge. Now, I am no engineer. You can check this with Andrew later, whether I'm even in the ballpark here. But if a truck driver ignores the signs about the limits for the bridge, maybe he's only putting himself into danger if there's not too much traffic around him. But if the engineer building the bridge, and here you can ask Andrew, if the engineer makes even small compromises in his work, he can get a lot of people killed. Even if he does it, as we see perhaps in our city some rumors about this, to save the city money, or to make the bridge prettier, or to make things easier for commuters, 
this well-meaning and steadfast pastor had been allowing compromises in his church to put the very souls in his church in danger. It's no wonder that in a city that Jesus calls the throne of Satan for its idolatry and its pagan religions, and the pagan religions included temple prostitution that was publicly approved, It's no wonder that Christians faced serious temptations to compromise in this city. Jesus himself, please remember, Jesus himself was once tempted by Satan. I mean, really tempted. This wasn't just like duck, sorry, water off a duck's back. This was real. It got to him, and he had to respond leaning on Scripture to protect his heart from the offers from the things that Satan offered. Jesus was tempted by Satan's offers of food and protection and power in Matthew chapter 4 verses 2 through 10. The religions of Pergamum offered Christians the same three things, food and power and protection, acceptance, the needs of your body, Safety, if you just go along with the flow. Plus, they also offered public permission to indulge their sexual impulses almost however they liked. Look with me at verse 14. I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that they might eat food sacrificed to idols and practice sexual immorality. Satan's been doing this for a long time, since Adam and Eve. His goal is to get people to stop trusting God's way, to stop believing God, and to start questioning God's generosity and God's goodness. To look for things that they can get elsewhere instead of looking for the things they need from God. The Balaam incident was an infamous blot in Israel's history. It's a really famous story. And thousands of Israelites that day gave in to these same temptations mentioned in verse 14. So I wonder... How would you feel? Imagine you're the pastor of this church and you get a letter from Jesus, which would be earth shattering, I I understand. But you get a letter from Jesus and this letter, he starts off saying good things and you're feeling a little bit encouraged by that. But then Jesus himself says, yet I have a few things against you. How would you feel that there were people in his church, in your church, guilty of eating food, sacrificed to idols and sexual immorality? See, these two temptations mentioned in verse 14 were such common first century problems for Christians that Paul in 1 Corinthians devotes two and a half chapters at least to these two issues. We know all about today, like we know a lot about sexual temptation. We know what this is like to live in a culture inundated with sex. Twisting the idea that God intended for sex and making it into something it shouldn't be. Seek, like pulling us to, to look for things that we need from all kinds of things that are illicit instead of looking for the things that we really need from God. Don't we? I once heard a pastor who, who I love say, he asked the question, or he said, you know, I, I believe every one of us in this church, and it was a church of a couple thousand people. He said, I believe every one of us in this church knows what it's like to feel very deeply pulled and seduced by the sexual temptations of our culture. He said, we want that. And he said, and if you don't, if you say you don't want it, then you've also got a lying problem. Whether it's thinking it's fine to live with someone who's not your spouse. Or whether it's fine to just sort of try to keep that habit of pornography under control and and maintain it. Don't just choke it off and kill it, but you just feed it a little bit. Or whether it's fine to cheat on your wife just from time to time and you've kind of got an agreement. Or whether it's fine 
to read material that, or watch things on TV that really get into our heads and make us entertain the idea that marriage is not sacred, that your spouse does not deserve all of your attention, does not deserve to be cherished by you, even when things are rough. We know all about sexual temptation, but the thing about food sacrificed to idols might seem pretty hard to relate to right now. The principle, however, is more relevant today than you might think. With all the temples of idols in Pergamum and all the animal sacrifices going on in those temples, there were lots of halls available. Temples were buildings and they had rooms. There were lots of halls available for public rental where you could have a feast in one of those halls. In fact, the food that the temples offered in their venue to guests was really discounted. It was cheap because it was left over from the animal sacrifices. Because they didn't need the whole animal for a sacrifice, just little parts of it. So they, they take the rest of the food and serve it up on trays and serve it to the guests who book their halls for public parties. Okay, that's a little bit more relatable. So weddings, anniversaries, holiday feasts. You understand, these were normally held in temple venues. But for a Christian to go to one of those places would make it look like in public like they were approving of idol worship. So 1 Corinthians 8.10 specifically warns against doing that. Said that that this undermines the entire public testimony of being a Christian. Saying, I worship Christ, but I also, at least as the public would think, I also worship Asclepios or Zeus or Athena. All this to say that we all like good food. Especially when it's affordable food. We all like celebrating with our friends and celebrating the things that they care about, the important occasions with them. It hurts us to say no to those things. It's hard. But there are times when taking part in what our friends are celebrating in our culture might make it look like we don't really believe Jesus. We don't really worship Him only. We don't really believe his word. That we approve of sin. And yet for these Christians in Pergamum, just a little bit of compromise on such things might prevent people from suspecting they were Christians. So don't the ends justify the means? Wouldn't that just make the temptation worse? Look again with me at verses 14 and 15. I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that they might eat food sacrificed to idols and practice sexual immorality. So also, you have some who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Maybe you're not clear, on the other hand, about... God's design for sex. The Bible's pretty clear about what constitutes sexual immorality. There's not really much room for debate about what the Bible says. But Christians often seem to go to one extreme or the or another, and that's where most of the arguments seem to happen. Where real confusion sets in is Christians arguing with another group of Christians, not arguing about what the Bible says. I wish we'd just stick to that. There's a kind of a funny place in 1 Corinthians 7 where Paul actually seems to be quoting from a letter that he got from some really strict Christians in Corinth who said basically, in my paraphrase, sex is bad. And they expected Paul to agree with them. Sex is bad. He wrote back that although God never intended sex to be enjoyed outside of a marriage between one man and one woman, and therefore anything outside of those bounds is sin, 1 Corinthians 6, 15-20, Paul goes on to say that sex inside of a godly marriage is a really good thing, 1 Corinthians 7, 1-5, read it. Confusion about this is not new. You've got people overreacting and saying sex is bad, stay away from sex. And people reacting against that saying no, sex is good, everything is good. In the church. Am I wrong? I wasn't sure what you meant. Am I wrong? Confusion about this is not new. 
So to illustrate how dangerous these two temptations are, these common temptations, looking to be part of the culture and go along with the culture and eat where the culture eats, celebrate what the culture celebrates, indulge what the culture indulges in. To show how serious these are, Paul reminded his readers about the Balaam incident in 1 Corinthians 10.8, saying that Israel once gave in to these temptations as well, and 23,000 died in a single day because of it, in judgment from God. Now, what about the Nicolaitans? Because he says in verse 15, So also you have some who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Nicolaitans, as I explained a couple of weeks ago, refers to people who've been sucked into going along with the sinful values of the culture instead of obeying Jesus. I think the word is not really uh, a a word about an actual historic cult, although some have later said that it was. There's no evidence for it. So I think the word itself, just in Greek, it means conquered people or something like that. Nicolaos, conquered people. So people who've been compromised by the culture. Then we get to the words in verse 15, so also. In verse 15, meaning just as, just as Israel lost 23,000 people in one day because of Balaam, so also the church in Pergamum was in danger because some of their members were giving in to the temptations of their city, eating out at temple parties and having sex outside of monogamous heterosexual marriage. And the reason Jesus uses the teaching of Balaam to illustrate the error of the compromised people, the Nicolaitans, in his church is that nobody who knew the Bible, nobody who knew the Bible would ever say that Balaam's teaching was harmless. God's word was so obvious on this. And the danger Israel brought on themselves so well known, 23,000 in a single day, that so also, verse 15, to sin oneself is forgivable. To lead others to sin is a grave danger. My friends, we all have fallen in one way or another to sexual immorality. There is not a man or woman among us who is immune to those temptations in our heart or with our bodies. To sin oneself is forgivable. To make a practice of sinning. To by your example influence others and say it's okay. It's okay to keep on dabbling in this temptation long term. It's okay. It's all forgivable. To lead others into sin by your example is, as someone has said, the greatest anger of Christ is against those who teach others to sin. So Jesus promises what Satan cannot. We come to verse 16. And I read this verse over and over and over. I've been listening to it in my audio Bible thing in our, one of our vehicles that drive back and forth to the city over and over and over. And it has become clear to me that when Jesus commanded this minister in verse 16, this minister, he commanded the minister to repent. It's singular. You repent. It's become clear to me that it was a call for him to preach the gospel. Look at verse 16. Therefore, repent. The you there is built into the grammar in the Greek original. Jesus says, if not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. This is a command not for the whole church to repent, but for the pastor to repent. He was given a chance to repent, but if not, if he doesn't, the unbelieving members of his church were in danger, like the 23,000 Israelites who perished because of Balaam. Verse 16, repent. He, singular, must repent, or else Jesus will come with the sword against them, plural. They were in danger from the sword of Christ's mouth. 
That means that what he had to do, what the pastor had to do, was help them really believe in Jesus. Really believe. Not just agree with Christian teaching. Trust. Depend. Place their confidence in Christ. He needed to preach the gospel to his church in Pergamum. He was faithful enough to stay. Now he needed to evangelize the ones who thought that they were Christians but weren't. Because only if they really started trusting the salvation of Jesus, the superiority of Jesus over all earthly promises, only then would they be saved from the sword of Jesus. And only if they trusted him enough to start obeying him also. Obedience is a fruit of trust. We're not saved by our obedience. We're saved by faith. We're justified by faith. We're saved by grace. I know there were at least two of you, three of you thinking that. We are saved by God's grace, not by our works. And yet, if we are saved and we've come to worship him, then we will begin to stop choosing other things and start choosing him. We will begin to stop looking to other things to satisfy us or to keep us safe or to fill our hunger. And we will start choosing Him. Won't we? It's really kind of ironic. Jesus is loving. But He is also Lord. That's not really the irony I meant. It's kind of ironic that the Romans only tried to force Christians to say the words, Caesar is Lord. Christians couldn't just say Jesus is Lord. Their lives had to also show it. It couldn't just be lip service. They had to serve their true king. If he's their true king. The actual word here for sword refers to a long large sword from nearby Thrace, nearby to Pergamum. It was used for cutting as well as piercing, not just stabbing, but hacking. And the same word for sword occurs in Revelation 19, verse 15 and verse 21, where Jesus, at his return, will strike the nations with the sword from his mouth in Revelation 19. He will destroy the nations with the word that he speaks. He doesn't need a sword. He's got a word. And it's a, it's a double-edged, sharp sword. It's not a defensive weapon. It's not for protection. It's meant for destroying. And it's already sharp and ready to destroy. It can surgically separate one pew sitter from another pew sitter. It can surgically divide the fake Christian from the true follower of Jesus Christ. Like John wrote in John 3, 3, um, 3 verse 18, whoever doesn't trust Jesus is already condemned because he's already Jesus' enemy. my friends it's not too late to change your allegiance if that hits you hard the idea that you are Jesus enemy right now because you've rejected him so far if that's a heaviness for you look at this promise it's not too late to change your allegiance he is Lord but he is loving The thing is that what Jesus promises is so much better than anything in this world. Anything even Satan actually offered Jesus. And those were pretty amazing promises. But the world can't touch the promises of Jesus. Matthew 4, just read them and think, would I have given in to those things? And the answer is yes, you would have. So would I. We do all the time. I can imagine this good pastor preaching this letter, these six verses, with all of his heart and all of his gusto, especially verse 17. He who has an ear, let him hear. Listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. 
I don't know how he could pray or preach this without tearing up at the thought. Listen, my beloved church, the Spirit is speaking to you. Did you know that the, same, the word for hear, and we were talking about this this morning with a couple of us, from the Shema, the, the Hebrew, hear, O Israel. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Adonai Echad. And hear, that word hear also means obey. The idea is implicit that if you hear God, you're going to obey Him. Hear, O Israel. Listen, O church. Just listen to these wonderful promises in verse 17. First, Jesus promises that if you keep on trusting him without compromise, he's going to give you hidden manna. Now that doesn't sound remarkable, but listen to this again. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, not who is conquered by the world, but who overcomes the world, the one who stays true to Jesus. I will give some of the hidden manna and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on that stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. This is really good news. Some of the hidden manna. The last few verses of Exodus 16 reminds God's people to remember how God fed Israel, to not forget that, how God fed Israel with manna from heaven. Manna means in Hebrew, what is it? And as they saw this, some kind of bread fall from the sky and it was dusting the ground and they looked at it and said, what is it? And they thought that was a good name, so they called it that. The miraculous provision of food for the, the life of their bodies that God provided 40 years in the wilderness. Exodus 16 commands them to take some of that and preserve it and place it inside the Ark of the Covenant. Hide it away to remind them that day after day after day through their wilderness, God kept them alive by the bread he supplied. And this was intended to point them forward to God's coming, to the presence of Christ. And Jesus said in John 6.33, The bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And the people listening to him said, Give us some of that bread. And Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Stop asking me for bread and ask me for me. I am the bread of life for the believers in Pergamum who felt how hard it is, how much sacrifice it meant to, to turn away from the parties that their friends invited them to, to have to sort of separate a little bit from the world around them so that they weren't covered in the same seemingly approval, a seeming approval of idol worship. Who had to say no to things like weddings of people they love. Because of what the wedding represented to them. All the things that they had to turn away from. My friends, for them, when they heard this about hidden manna that Jesus would give them if they stay true to him, this is not just good news, this is better news. Jesus can satisfy our hunger in ways the world never will. Do you know what he promises to give us? He promises to give us himself. God the Son will satisfy every deepest longing and need of your heart. Nothing else can. And you know it, nothing else ever does. Isaiah 62 verse 2 gives us some insight on the the new name that Christ promises to write on the stone he will give you. It says, The nations shall see your righteousness and all the kings your glory, and you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. The new name is the name of Christ that he gives us when we're adopted into God's family. The new name is the name of Christ our groom when we one day enter into marriage covenant with him forever as his church. The new name is the name Christian. But there are many hard days when you and I will wonder if that's really our true name. Am I a Christian? No one will know, Jesus says, except the one who receives it. 
what is that name written on your stone? And even then, we all sometimes have doubts whether we're even sure that is our name. What is my name again? The way to know for sure that your name is that of a child of God, the way to know for sure that your name is that of the bride of Christ, the way to know for sure that Christ has given you a name and it's not the one you were born with, it's the one you were reborn with. The way to know for sure is to remember the white stone that Christ gives you. Matthew Henry explained that this was from the ancient custom of giving a white stone to those acquitted after a trial and a black stone to those condemned. What kind of stone have you got? My dear brothers and sisters, when your sin threatens your assurance of salvation, you say, am I really a Christian if I keep stumbling to the same weakness? Don't look to Satan's lies for comfort to make you feel better about it. Don't look to Satan's lies for satisfaction or protection or power. Look to Jesus. He received the black stone of condemnation for sins he did not commit so that we could receive the white stone of his perfect, innocent acquittal. The verdict has been handed down. The court case is over. Because of Jesus, our verdict is innocent, acquitted, accepted, justified, freely, forever. Because of Jesus, trust in him today. When sin, when sin, your sin, my sin, when it threatens our assurance, don't trust in your sense of assurance. Trust in Jesus. Take hold of that white stone that he promised, even if it's hard to really believe it's true. Believe him when he says it. Believe him, not it. Hold fast his name tomorrow. Never deny his faith but believe his good promises. My friends, how good and faithful our Sir, Savior is. How good and faithful he is. I want to close with the words from the first part of Revelation, beginning halfway through verse 5. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Oh, Father, as we pray, let us fall upon the mercy and kindness of your promises, Lord. By the comfort of your Holy Spirit now, as you turn us towards our sin, Lord, not running away from our sin, but realizing our sin, confessing our sin, facing the reality that without Christ we are lost. In fact, worse, we've become enemies of Christ. Because of our rejection of you, because of our rejection of your goodness, because of our rejection of your promises, we've made ourselves your enemies. Father, save us from the wrath of your Son. Son, save us from the wrath of the Father. Father, I pray you will give us the Holy Spirit now to turn our hearts to look up to Jesus, to see the promises that he has made that everyone who calls on the name of this Lord will be saved. To know that our grace that we receive from you is not something we have earned. Jesus already earned it. To know that the announcement, the declaration that we are now innocent, acquitted, is not something we prove. It's something already Jesus has proven. We trust in him. Give us faith, Lord, to receive this great gift of salvation this morning. Give us faith to obey you today and tomorrow, this week and next. Give us faith to hold fast the name of Jesus until he comes again. And let him be glorified in us, his church. Amen.